today, as I mentioned, we have Enrico De Paoli from Rio joining us and Frank Socorro. And this session is recorded. So the way it's going to work is, and Frank, you can maybe explain more, but we have a Q&A application. Everybody is welcome to ask for questions. And then um, Frank will be, or Enrico will be looking at the questions and answering the question. If you want, you can raise your hand and ask the question verbally as well. Uh, but really the purpose of this, you, everybody has now a webinar or has content on Facebook Live or, or YouTube. What's special about Music Expo is the interactivity. We have the privilege for the next 50 minutes to be with world-class engineers. And it's an opportunity for you to ask any questions directly about their workflow or the topic of the day. So do not refrain. Please be as vocal as possible. This is the spirit of Music Expo, which some of you have attended the physical event. And actually, what I would love to know now from you and a good way to kick things off while we transition to Frank and Enrico is please, in the chat room, let us know where you're dialing from. We want to know where you're coming from and say hello. So please, uh, Ben, Bob, Connor, uh, Felix, Francisco, Gary, uh, Risto, we had you last week. Great to have you. You go. Please let us know where you're, where you're dialing from. Chicago. San Lorenzo. And I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, Homestead, and Miami. And what do we see here? Chicago, San Lorenzo. Yeah. Hey, someone has been to the Music Expo in uh, here at Expression. Oakland, Texas. Great. Homestead, Miami. And Risto, always late. Huh? Let us know, bro, if you if you want us to do an uh, online session early for you. All right. Jeremias from Belém. Beautiful. Gary B. from Miami. What up, Gary? What's up, Gary? All the Miami people, uh, I invite you to buy me a beer afterwards. <laughs> 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 Broward. Oh, we got a lot of Florida people. Cool. Right. Well, you guys take it from here. Awesome. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Loic. Um, thank you, everybody who's joining. Thank you, Enrico. Um, so the purpose of today uh, is to talk about something that Enrico and I both uh, do, um, which is uh, we mix, uh, but we use uh, a kind of an analog style uh, because we both come from an analog mixing world. I've been doing this a while, so has Enrico, and we're both used to working in consoles and and recording kind of a, in a more traditional fashion. So now working inside of a DAW, uh, we try to bring some of those aspects uh, that we're so used to using uh, into uh, the digital world. So just a little bit of background on me or just a little background on kind of my system. This is this is my room here and typically when I work here uh, I have a way that I route things. I have a Neve summing mixer uh, and I print out of that into a Burl uh, B2 bomber which is another uh, digital audio um, there's a little uh, I'm sorry I just reading there's a bit of cracking um, is it okay now? Are we good? Your voice is crackling, crackling to me too. Is it better now? I mean, I, I can, I can, I can totally understand what you say. It's it is crack. Like that bad. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just like some. Craig, are you hmm. going through a That's... mic? Or it's just now during the rehearsal, it was not happening. Yeah, maybe now that there's more people on. I mean, I'm going through a mic. Yeah. Uh, is it distortion or is it like digital no, it's internet like, stuff? Like, yeah, digital. Hmm. Let me check something. Sorry, guys. Um, Your story is saying it's Zoom. Yeah, to totally, it was not happening during the rehearsal, so it could be the uh, the band with uh, everybody logged on. Okay, well, I hear everybody else okay, so maybe it's just me. Um, but can you guys understand what I'm saying? Maybe it'll kind of just stop. Yeah, I, I, is it better? Thank you. Uh, no, it hasn't changed, but but yeah, you. I think you can go on if. Okay. Okay. Are we, are Let me we just. Everybody online, we're good to go on? Okay. Want to make sure you know. Okay, cool. Thank you, okay, guys. Cool. Let us know if there's an issue. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah. Thank you, guys. All right. Um, so the way that I typically work, like I was saying, is I go through, um, somebody said it's like vinyl. 
<laughs> this is how we're already doing the uh, style that makes it's it already style. analog style <laughs> now, um, now i need now i need to add some tape to my voice oh <laughs> uh, no so so the, what i was saying was i i mix uh kind of like if i was still working on a bigger console and i was still kind of printing to a separate device like a tape machine because one of the things about analog that sometimes we forget is that analog wasn't one thing that you put on your mix like you recorded from a microphone through a console to a tape machine and then when you mix you'd play the output of that tape machine back through your console when you inserted compressors eqs whatever on that console more electronics out of there and then you print to a half inch machine so the whole time you're introducing all your audio to all this analog equipment uh that's giving it a uh, sauce for the for lack of a better term um and then when and then at the end there was like all this kind of like stuff you would add to it so my approach when i mix now is still trying to get some of that feel with using the summing mixer with printing back through my burrow um with using external eqs and compressors and stuff like that but there's also a time when i can't do that uh, right now you know, a lot of us are working from home. Maybe we don't have access to us. Like this stuff is not in my house. I can't bring this home. My wife would kill me. So I have to work on my laptop. So uh, I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about just kind of workflows and stuff that you can do to kind of bring that kind of feel and sound together uh, for your DAW mixes. Now, is there like a one plugin, you know, fixes everything? Absolutely not. This is, this is for me, it's a process. Um, but um, let's kind of, I'm going to share my screen with you a little bit, uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit of some routing stuff uh, that I like to do that makes my mixes in the box similar to what I'm doing when I'm here on my summing mixer. So I'm going to um, share my screen, and I'm going to show you my Pro Tools screen. Can everybody see my screen? Cool. All right. So here's a, a song uh, that I've been working on or that I worked on. I actually took the vocals out of here because um, the song isn't out yet. So I couldn't actually play you guys uh, the vocals, but I just wanted to break down um, some very simple stuff. Now, Enrico is going to show you a track that has like live instrumentation. This is all program stuff. So if you notice a lot of the, it's very sparse as far as like plugins and stuff, because uh, when it's a lot of program stuff, I try not to do a lot. Uh, but what I do try to do is I work on the sub mixes. So here's an instrument bus and instrument bus is usually where I put any keyboard, synth, guitars, anything of that nature. Then I have a drum bus where I put, you know, obviously the drums. And then I have a separate track for the bass uh, where I tend to do um, all the low end stuff. If it's like a hip hop track with an 808, it also goes uh, with the drums. I mean, with the bass. So bass and 808 for me go together. Um, and then all that is routed to a master, uh, which is essentially the same thing that I do when I'm working in the console, when I'm working on my summing mixer here. I take essentially four stereo groups, vocals, keys, bass, and drums. And I bring that into my summing mixer and I print out of that summing mixer through my barrel back into Pro Tools. When I don't have access to my studio, like currently where a lot of, of us are dealing with staying home, I set up my mix the exact same way inside of Pro Tools. And I route all my instrument groups to those subgroups. I process those subgroups as if, you know, we were in a console. Uh, and then um, I will then send all that to a master, which is kind of like my print back. And I will do additional processing there um, so that I can kind of, through that process all the way going down through, I'm constantly trying to add harmonic content. Why four groups, somebody asked, or why uh, Loic asked? Because for a long time, I've only had eight outputs on my links. And so I only went out eight, even though there's 16 inputs on the Neve, I only use eight. And it's also uh, for ease of recall. So if I ever have to recall a mix, I'm only recalling four channels. I'm not recalling 16. That track was uh, my, this microphone that's actually in the session. That's why there's a trim on it uh, because um, this is a SM7 and it's actually doesn't have, it needs a lot of gain. 
Uh, somebody asked, do I also have a vocal bus? Yes, but like I said earlier, I, I took all the vocals out of this session because uh, I can't actually play the vocals because the song hasn't come out yet. Um, but there is a vocal bus uh, and I can talk about some of the stuff that I do on the vocal bus as well. So um, I want to ask Enrico his kind of routing setup and then it, you know what he does. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody I know. Hello, everybody I don't know. <laughs> Frank. First and foremost, Frank, thank you so much for inviting me over, for um, introducing me to uh, the Music Expo uh, friends. It's a big, big honor to be here. Thank you. It's a big honor to be here and a big honor to be hosting this with you. Uh, ever since I was at SAE, I wanted to do something like this with you. So here we are. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, and thank you, the Music friends also for hosting this. Dwight and Hannah. Well, Frank, uh, you mentioned uh, something really cool before I go with my, uh, my, my workflow. You mentioned something that's, you, you, you said you showed your session in there. I actually envied your session because I barely <laughs> saw any plug in there. And, and you mentioned that you end up processing subgroups. And that reminds me of uh, a, a situation that most people have gone through, which is you you make rough mixes of you, you know the work you uh, you're working on, and when finally you you get to mix down days, you know full days, two three days mixing a song, and sometimes you spend like a week mixing a song, and when you go back to listen to your um, uh, rough mix, it sounds the better rough. than what you had, <laughs> and. And a lot of times we just process too much each and every track, you know, listening to that track and we forget to listen to, to, to the track in context to, to the music, to the whole thing. And if we go back, you know, to how music was produced quite a few decades ago, there wasn't, you know, consoles with compressors, gates and five, six bands EQ uh, on each and every, you know, channel. Mm -hmm. There was like just very scarce features to uh, to do anything, and they sounded all together and all nicely glued together naturally. So I think we're actually coming around in a in a production uh, point of view. We're coming around to to discovering that less less is more. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you know processing subgroups is um, is a something that you do. And, and after I started mastering in stems, I learned that I may, well, let me go to my workflow then, which I will come back to, well, yeah. to what I'm talking about. So the way I mix, I'm going to start from the way I master. Sure. Uh, I'm going to go backwards. So from about 10 years ago on, I started mastering in stems. And honestly, I don't think I invented this, <laughs> but when I started mastering stems, I hadn't heard of anything, anyone doing it. And uh, well, there wasn't so much internet communication then. I'm sure a lot of people were doing it, but you know, I just didn't know about it. And I ended up getting the, uh, the X-Desk, that little SSL baby uh, super analog console. And what can you do with eight faders? So I was like, well, I, I won't be able to mix with this. So I'm just going to run uh, stems, right, to, to the X desk. But just summing the, the, the audio by itself, in my opinion, wouldn't cause that much of it. I mean, it does cause a difference, but I wanted more. But for me to start, you know, bringing kick drum, bass, vocals, and EQing, and all of a sudden I would come to a to a problem that you also mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, that recallability, you know, making revisions would become just a mess, right? Mm -hmm. Especially mm -hmm. each day the, the business moves faster and faster. So I ended up deciding to mix in the box and to make masters in stems. So the master process in stems actually is what gives me the analog, the real analog flavor, not the virtual analog flavor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
I used to, to, to make all my mixes, and once the mixes were done, I used to go searching track by track, channel by channel. Hey, Enrico, what, real quick. Yeah. Can you turn your voice a little bit up? Some of the guys are having a, a, a little bit hard time hearing you. Just give it a little bit more. Is it better now? Yeah, that's, ba that's way better, yeah. Yeah, well, if, it, if, it, if yeah. it gets too loud or if you want more, you let me know. It's because the, the mic's on the side. Sure, sure. Okay, so um, when my mi when I was mixing in the box and when my mix was done, I would, um, I would just go search, you know, screen each and every channel to route that channel to, to the correct output to, to, to the SSL, uh, each and every stem. And then I, you know, it, 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 I had issues that I would forget or misroute some track, right? So a new update to my workflow became starting my mix with subgroups already done in the session from, from, from the, all the way from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing that, um, I started actually processing subgroups as I, as I was mixing and not only during the mastering. But that processing, that stem processing was virtual, right? Okay, so mixing in the box into four subgroups also because of the same reasons that you mentioned, you know, eight, <laughs> output, eight interface outputs and ease of uh, less is more, right? Back mm -hmm. then you had, you had tr uh, a whole albums that were recorded in, in four, four tracks. Four <laughs> tracks or, and then eight tracks and, and they sounded great too to mix, you know, uh, to balance those stems. Um, so so uh, once my, my mix is finished and my process is done, all I have to do is grab those four subgroups and route them to the SSL as opposed to route them to the uh, main mm -hmm. output fader in, within the DAW. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so we're talking as for mixing in the box and routing things to the outside world to sum and process in the analog domain. And then you mentioned something when you were speaking about creating sound and a mojo uh, with using plugins that you would kind of simulate, you know, the setup that you use. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, everybody has tried to, to do that has played around doing that uh, using plugins that would simulate uh, modeling plugins. But something else came to my mind not too long ago, actually around three, four years ago, I was ministering a, a, a training session, a week long training session at a, a large home studio. The guys had an SSL AWS, mm -hmm. a 24 channel SSL uh, analog board. And the way I set up the training with them was I would mix a song using the SSL and then I would mix the same song again, totally in the box. And the way I carry that, that on, instead of just, because mixing in the box for me until that day was, you know, kick drum. Oh, let's insert an LA-2A. Let's insert a Poltec. Oh, a snare drum. And then I would find the best EQ for, the, the, for that snare drum. And then I would go mm -hmm. on and I would spend like three, four days, you know, just opening plugins and sorting through plugin menus. Mm -hmm. Not a good time for a phone call. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, that day I decided that to make the training fit within the time frame I had with those guys, and also to make sense of, of the whole mix I, I I did using their analog SSL, I decided to open an SSL channel across every channel on in in my in the box mix, mm -hmm. and that changed my world for mixing. That day, I realized that going back to the 80s, it was not only about sound. Now I'm talking about speed, you know, uh, mm -hmm. being more agile and, 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 uh, and not losing track of the, of, the, of the song. Having the same channel strip across every channel totally simulates, makes you feel, not only sound-wise, but makes you feel workflow-wise as if you're reaching out to an SSL channel in front of you. Because there is, there is a speed component. There's a speed, the speed component, component to, 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 that lets you stay in the mix. Track. 
Yeah, exactly. Alex. So staying, staying involved. Uh, I have a question here already uh, from Jeremiah. He wants to know how to accomplish space and depth analog style in the box today. Is it possible? Um, I think uh, accomplishing space and depth is all about creating space and depth. Um, and I know that sounds stupid because I'm answering your question with the same words, but the reality is, is that taking stuff out that you don't need is what creates a lot of space and depth. Um, and then especially when we're talking about this kind of stuff, I think sometimes people are like, oh, they put all these plugins that have like this analog warmth stuff. And it ends up just adding a lot of like noise and rumble kind of at a at a at a part at a, at a kind of place in your mix. And sometimes that can muddy up your mix and kind of make it like all scrunched together. Um, so I think it's it's cool to use those things as flavor, but it's also important to notice when they're kind of taking away from everything else and just kind of like adding mud. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Jeremiah. Um, Enrico, can you can I also to talk? Yeah, can I talk yeah. about that same point yeah. that you're that you're yeah. Yeah. answering him? Um, yeah. Excellent. It's it's great to do this with two people because I would have never <laughs> answered what you said, and it totally makes sense what you say. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because it's 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 very uh, seducing to have all those analog style plugins, and not only they add noise, some of them let you you know dial back the uh, the noise amount, the analog knob, mm -hmm. but they add you know some sort of. Uh, compression, analog compression and harmonic drive. And mm -hmm. that starts adding up elements, you know, because harmonics are new elements. Correct. Harmonics are sounds that weren't there before. And if you start Correct. adding up harmonics and more harmonics and more harmonics, all of a sudden you have something so rich that you don't have any space anymore. Right? So said that, one thing that I, I learned from listening to the Mick Gozowski mixes in the 90s, Mm -hmm. I hope I, I pronounced his no, last name right. You did. And, and I hope that um, for those of you who are watching, who are interested, you guys go back and look for those Mick Kozowski mixes. Those are some great mixes from that time. And, and if you need a point of reference there, for, especially for vocals, I think he, he would do a great job. Yeah, he is, he is really, really good. And, and what I learned from listening to, from hearing his mixes was contrast and creating space and depth is all about contrast. Of course, contrast starts in, in the arranging process, you know, because you can, it's the instrumentation, how many instruments are gonna be playing together and what kind of timbers are gonna counter play with each other. Okay, that creates a lot of contrast. And now when you're miking those things, if we're talking about an analog acoustic session, and, but when you're mixing, um, you, instead of just adding a little bit of verb to everybody and pushing everybody back, you know, you, you have a dry signal, a dry uh, sound, a timber, a wet sound, uh, uh, a muffled sound, a bright sound, because our ears tend to get used to what they listen to very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like tasting something, you know, you, you eat something sweet and then you eat something sour. You, 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 it's a contrast. big difference. Mm -hmm. a, now, if you start eating, having a lot of sweet, 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 all of a sudden that becomes normal. You know, mm -hmm. it's like mixing. If you start brighten up, brightening, brightening up things in the mix, all of a sudden that shine becomes your flat, flat curve to your ears at that moment. So mm -hmm. when you go listen, go listen to your mix in the next day, you know, it's screaming uh, uh, harsh or to the exactly. other way also. So playing with exactly. contrast, I think it's what makes you create uh, uh, depth and what, what was the other term? Depth. And space and space. space. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, we got actually three more questions. So let's go through this and then uh, we'll kind of jump. I want you to show uh, your routing a little bit and then I'll kind of show a little bit of my drum bus and then we can kind of keep going. Um, so the first one is from Hugo. Uh, Hugo, uh, he wants to know, how do you make sure uh, you're avoiding the degrading sound occurring losses through DNA and A to D conversion? And is there a benchmark you look to evaluate those losses and how do you assess if they are acceptable? So Enrico, as far as like your A to D and D to A, is there something that you kind of do to make sure that you're, you know, getting good levels and that you're not losing anything on your conversion? 
Well, um, answering that question as far as monitoring uh, and evaluating, of course, uh, all sorts of meters and, and RTAs and whatever the visual uh, monitoring you can have is all, always a good thing. But the bottom line for me is uh, hearing, right? Uh, what, how it sounds to my ears. So theoretically, going through a D2A and A2D is something that we would like to avoid any, any time, right? But we need to go through them because if, if you don't go through a, a D2A, you, you would never hear what, what's in the computer. So mm -hmm. you need converters at some point in time and to make the sound go into the computer as well. Just to illustrate that answer and that, that my answer and, and give you the word back, um, I mixed a record uh, quite a, you know many years ago, like 15 years ago on an SSL Axiom MT, which was a large format SSL digital console. And the output of the SSL was going to uh, two, two tracks in the Pro Tools using two different patches. One was a digital patch, one was an analog patch. Enrico, we kind of lost your voice there. I don't know if that's everybody or is that just me? We lost a bit as well, yeah. Yeah. We crashed there for a moment. Well, um, so I mean, I can, I can kind of, while well, he comes back, is he back? Um, so just for uh, for Hugo's question, uh, one of the things that, I mean, I use a Lynx converter going out, um, which is the best converter I could afford when I bought it. Uh, and then printing back, I print back through my Burl, which is was the best converter I could afford when I got that. Um, okay, uh, Pro Tools closed. Uh, so he's going to restart his Pro Tools. Uh, and that's kind of what, what I did to make sure that I was losing the least amount of um, signal on my out and in because when we do mix uh, out here I do have to go out and I do have to come back uh, so I just make sure that I'm I have the best level so I do before my mixes I run tones I make sure that you know zero is zero everywhere and I'm not losing anything and I also check things like phase and I check uh, I send white noise and pink noise and I, and I check all those things before my mixes just to make sure that what I'm sending out is exactly what I'm getting back um, um, as far as A to D and D to A, and I, and I hope that that makes sense for you, Hugo. Um, and then we have a, another question from Shivan Gupta. Uh, what's your take on recording revolution SIP or Gram shows adding a waves SL channel strip to every channel on your DAW to make it sound analog? Does it make sense? Well, I think Enrico kind of spoke about that before, um, um, that, he, that he had done that and how that kind of changed um, how he worked. Um, not only because of the way the plugin sounds, but also for the ease of getting to work. I think when we're mixing, sometimes we get too caught up. I know I used to do this, you know, when I kind of was younger and, and starting out, I was like, I have all these plugins. I'm going to use everything. And I can't wait to mix your song because I got a new plugin. And it's like wasting time trying to figure out what plugin or what's cool or what, what you got instead of like just focusing on the music is something that a lot of young engineers go through. Um, when reality, if you can just kind of just get to mixing, setting levels and kind of getting like a rough EQ really quickly, you kind of stay in the moment. And then I find that the mix tends to eat, one, go a lot faster. And two, it actually sounds a lot better because you kind of just worked on that in the moment and you didn't try to just overdo it because we can overdo it. Are you back, Enrico? I, ho I hope so. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes, you are. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so was, we were talking I was, uh, about. I was hearing. I was hearing you all along. Okay. Um, do you have anything to yeah, talk about so, uh, this channel strip on every channel? Yeah. No, so uh, as for the A to D and D to A, mm. D to A, when I was when I was locked down, <laughs> um, when I got locked down here, uh, so I ended up that mix I was mixing on the SSL digital. Um, when I went to to the mastering stage. I printed, uh, 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 I had two prints of each and every mix. One co coming digitally from the board, no A to, A to D or D to A outside of the board and back into uh, two tracks in the Pro Tools. And one going through uh, D to A outside of the board and A to D back into Pro Tools. We ended up for most mixes, not for all of them, 
choosing the analog path. So theoretically, that's a dirtier, more distorted and changed uh, audio file. But musically, mm -hmm. it sounded better. But from uh, not always you want to change things. Sometimes you, it's not your job to change things. And uh, work uh, um, uh, signal flow wise, as I mentioned, my mixes are just, uh, they just go through subgroups. And then I use uh, a converter of, of, that I like, that I like the sound, which happens to be an older Apogee converter. Actually, I have mm -hmm. uh, a Rosetta, which is, which is an older one. It's not like a mastering grade converter, but I just love the sound of it. I just mm -hmm. like the sound of that converter. So since it's manipulating audio somehow, converting to digital and back to analog, I like the way it, it changes the audio in that converter. I, I actually have an older one, a PSX 100, a two channel version <laughs> that, you know, that's where I monitor my two track using the PSX. I just, I just like the sound of, of, of them too. Yeah. Uh, so on the other question, they were talking about adding a channel strip on every channel. Um, does it does it make sense? How does it make sense? For me to answer? Yeah, you can. I, I talked about it a little bit. You can talk to them about like putting the SSL okay. channel strips. So, uh, so when I discovered that I one way of mixing in the box would be create recreating an SSL or or an Eve, you know, whatever console you want but I was actually recreating an SSL across my Pro Tools mixer as opposed to, uh, to dial, you know, search through menus, endless menus of plugins. Now I kind of work as if I was in a big studio in the 90s. You know, I still open my SSL channel uh, across all channels, but for specific tracks that has specific needs, I go to that LA two A or to that um, sure. to that uh, Poltec or Aphex or Exciters, you know everything that we did back in the nineties. Now um, Waves has uh, can I speak brands? <laughs> yeah, of course, it's what you use. Waves has, um, in my opinion, a great, amazing second to none usability. Their plugins are very well written. You know the A and B uh, comparison. Uh, the, it's it's just very good to use, and their um, specific uh, modeling plugins for the uh, um, eleven seventy six and the LA two A, the LA three A, they they're just very good in my opinion. Um, but I just re encountered. I mean, I I known these guys from like twenty years ago. Now I just re found out the PSPs. You know the PSP audio wear, and mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. they don't model anything, but analog sounding stuff they are amazing. So I I might wanna when we start playing some samples, yeah, I might wanna show cool. some some stuff I'm doing cool. with with plugins. All right, okay. So there's two more. I'm gonna go ahead and, and go through them, and then we'll kind of move on. So Christo Kolev, you were the one that won the uh, the what you call it last time the 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 sonar works congratulations i hope it's working out for you and i hope i pronounced your name right close um so uh talking about space what is your opinion on using a high pass over every channel of course intelligently intelligently tuned for each instrument so me personally i only put high passes on things that need them um obviously to get rid of anything that i don't need uh, that instrument to do in the mix um so but i don't put it on everything um and and I have a habit of putting it always on the vocal just because when I started recording, a typical thing which was to get uh, some low noise. Um, uh, so it's just a habit and sometimes it's not even there and I just it's always on my vocal chain like for whatever reason. Uh, but I only do it on the instruments that I feel uh, are producing a low end that I don't need and it's going to muddy up my mix. What about you, Enrico? Uh, low uh, High pass filters. I actually... Um... I actually use them pretty much everywhere that I don't need the low end. And the reason I do that is because um, if we if we have any rumble that are not is not part of the music, mm -hmm. not only it steals um, 
energy from the amp. It steals mm -hmm. headroom because, you mm -hmm. know, think of a woofer moving and it's not meant yep. to produce any musical sound. It's just moving because, you know, the, uh, the mic stand was, 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 mm -hmm. you know, vibrating. So you're mm -hmm. actually stealing headroom and you're intermodulating, which means if you are, if the speaker is trying to reproduce an 800 Hertz, a thousand Hertz uh, frequency, and it's slowly moving, trying to reproduce a rumble at 10 Hertz, for instance, you know, uh, it, it, the speaker would be moving 1,000 times trying to reproduce the vocal, but it would also be moving, you know, 20 times a second to reproduce that rumble, and you would have a vocal going like this, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, so I think the mix sounds cleaner when you when you filter it. Which is you something don't need I to would... go. You don't need to go on each and every channel. If you subgroup things, you know, you just add a high pass. And as, as you said, be careful mm -hmm. not to steal musical sounds that, you know, belong to the music. Yeah, which is something, the thing you were just saying about the vocal is something that I want a lot of you guys to be careful of, um, which I hear a lot, especially when the mix bus is slammed. Um, I hear that a lot nowadays. Like you want to push the low end so much, but when you're hearing it, the vocal goes, uh, and it's because you're, the speakers are trying to do this, all this stuff at the same time, and they sometimes can't. So we have to be aware that our music, although we listen to really cool speakers or we buy really cool headphones or we listen in our really cool equipment, the people that are going to listen to this music are listening in their car on one speaker and it probably sounds like crap. So you have to be aware of that, like what you're trying to produce as well as like where people are going to listen to it. Um, I have one more question. How can we, oh, we have two more, but I'm going to do one and then I'm going to save the other one for later. How can you be confident that a mix will translate what, uh, translate well when mixing with headphones? I know you'll mention Sonarworks, Frank, and then untreated room and shirt in the box and just headphones, uh, is what I have. Well, uh, the main thing that I would suggest that if you want to make sure your mix translates is go listen to it other places. Um, most of you guys, if you're working on a laptop, there's nothing wrong with taking your laptop into the car, plugging the aux in, into your car radio and listening to the mix in the car. Um, send it to people, try to listen on your AirPods or whatever headphones you have. Um, that's my, that's my suggestion. Like listen to it in as many places as you can until you're confident that you know what's going on in the headphones. Uh, just because you have cool headphones or you have the sonar works doesn't mean that you know what your headphones sound like. You're going to have to get used to them and then hear what your mix sounds like other places. So then you can know what adjustments you need to make. One thing I could add to that is, um, it, it, of course, it's important to really know your references and, and, you know, uh, some people would ask, oh, should I use multiple reference uh, monitors or just stick to one and know it really well? Well, either way, I'm not really, I don't really enjoy, you know, switching to different monitors back and forth all the time because it may confuse your, your reference because your ears get used to something. But um, I think a good thing to do is to listen to, to, to your mix and, and make sure it sounds good in an environment where it's going to be mostly heard at. For instance, if I'm mixing Bossa Nova, it needs to sound good at low levels. Mm -hmm. If I'm mixing rock or EDM, it needs to sound good at loud, loud levels because people <laughs> are going to be listening to that loud. And the curve changes, not only the curve of, of the speaker, but our the perceived loudness of frequencies changes you know, at different uh, listening levels. So if you're if you're mixing for um, for a club, you know, and you have access to going to a club, you know, go to a club in the afternoon and play your mix there. And sure, maybe sure. having different stems, you don't have to go back to the full mix. You know, you just rebalance those stems. And I'll tell you guys, those of you, especially those of you who live in Miami, and uh, this might be a little bit weird, but. Uh, actually, going to strip clubs in the daytime, the DJ is usually bored, and he'll most of the time let you play your song in there. Um, and I know this because I've done it. Um, and and they'll let you play your song in there. They don't care. They're not doing anything. So um, if you don't have access to a club, I know this sounds crazy, but it works. Um, and I just gave away a, a secret. But, um, yeah, once COVID is over, definitely, like, you know, the lunch group Go out there and, 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 and it could be a good excuse. No, I just went there to, uh, <laughs> to check my message. You know? 
Yeah, all right, guys. <laughs> uh, um, all right. So let me go to, um, I'm going to show you guys some stuff because i uh, kind of short on time here a little bit, but I want to show you guys some stuff um, on my track and just kind of talk to you guys a couple of things on the, the different um the different auxes. Okay, so just really quickly. Um, so this is my instrument bus and I only have a couple of things on one of these tracks. I have some EQs here just because uh, I needed to brighten up and it was kind of like a like a sad piano. Um, let me mute this and I think that's the oh, I mute the bass and this and this. So uh, let me know if you guys hear this. <laughs> Cool, cool. So, so these were some pretty straightforward, like kind of reggaeton vibes. Um, um, and I, all I did here was because the keyboards already kind of sounded away and I didn't want to mess with them too much. Um, I used this C6 right here. And if you notice, um, this one has the external side chain. And what I was doing here um, is that when the vocal sings, it actually compresses this kind of band right here which is uh where a lot of your vocal kind of main part is uh, around that 1k area so i just kind of had that um doing that for me there and then on the drums i kind of had a little bit more going on uh oh it is it really me or sounding mono because uh it's probably mono because of the live stream even though i do have the original sound on um so so on the drum bus, I actually have a couple of different things. Uh, one of the things that's there was this one knob filter, which I actually not a big fan of because I think it, 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 it makes stuff weird. Um, but uh, the producer had it on there already, so I didn't want to kind of change that. So I actually put it at the end. Um, I actually put it on at the end and it worked out okay. Um, so, but... I want to show a couple of things that I put on the drum bus. This is the tan plugin. This is basically one of those like SSL emulations. Um, but one of the things that the guys at Acoustica do is that they have this schmod uh, or SH mod thing on most of their uh, compression plugins. And um, when I turn it up, it just gives me a nice kind of low end uh, little boost. So I'm going to play this. I'm going <laughs> to. So I don't know if you guys can all the way hear that, um, but it does give you like this nice kind of like low end. Um, I have an SSL EQ on here, boosting up some highs and also this right here, uh, a little bit of that kind of 100 Hertz. Uh, by the way, if you guys don't know what this button does is it divides this frequency by three and this one multiplies that frequency by three. So if you've ever not known what that does, that's what that does. Um, so I'll add this just to get a little bit of snap on the kick. Um, and importantly, I also do this on the drum bus, which is where I'll filter it. So I don't get those frequencies that Enrico was talking about, like super low, the, you know, the speaker trying to produce eight Hertz or something like that. And then this is something uh, that I just started using also from Acoustica. This is called the Psycho Bus Processor. Um, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like what the SSL Fusion plugin, uh, SSL Fusion boxes. And this one, I usually add, it adds harmonics. So you pick uh, the type of harmonics and how much you add to it. So I'll play this real quick. Give you guys an example. <laughs> So I hope you guys could hear that uh, through the Zoom. <laughs> I see three Fs. Um, I hope that that's a good thing. Um, so what I do when I'm using these kinds of things and these kinds of processes is I'm looking for harmonics, stuff that's going to add some, some, just some guts to the, some of this stuff because this is all programmed music. There's nothing recorded. There was no microphone. There was, there was nothing. Um, so I'm always looking to add some harmonics that weren't there and also helps me fill up my track. The reason that compressing your song makes it sound super loud is because you're bringing up all the extra harmonic content. Okay. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, I'm, let me give let me pass it over to Enrico uh, so he can kind of give you guys some stuff, and uh, and then I think we're gonna go to a Q and A and kind of have to wrap it up almost. So go ahead, Enrico. <coughs> that sounds good, man. Thank you. <laughs> I heard some I'm gonna plugins stop there that I'm. I heard some plugins there that I'm not used to. Um, <laughs> I tried. I tried some acoustica stuff back a while back, and 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 they they came a long way uh, with the looks. You know, they didn't used to look that good. They're looking. Yeah, good. no, they look great. They're they're great looking plugins. Do you want to? Uh... Do you want to show some stuff on your drum bus and then maybe do a little stereo bus and then kind of wrap this up? Here we go. Yeah. Are you logging in? Okay, he's acting up. Okay, so while um, while he's doing that, uh, where is it? I don't see a raised hand. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so we have, um, we have two questions. I'm going to go through them real quick. Uh, not sure if this pertains to the subject entirely, but wanted to know if you guys have a chance to test out Neve summing mixer emulation from Luna. Wondering thoughts on that. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I have not had the chance to check it out, but I did watch a presentation from them and it looks pretty interesting. Uh, I think it actually models a Neve 80 series, which is a great console. Um, and I love UA. I, I use a bunch of their stuff, so I'm sure it sounds great. Um, and then do you ever work without any plugins on the mix bus? Um, I actually usually start my uh, mix without anything on the mix bus. Um, and I only add stuff at the end because usually when I mix here and I go through my burrow, my burrow sounds a certain way. And I'm kind of used to that sound. And that's actually why I picked that converter. Um, so I look for, for that stuff. Um, Hannah is telling me that we have something to give away um, for an event. So uh, I guess I'm going to ask you guys a question. And then the first person to answer will definitely be getting something while Enrico sets his stuff back up. So I'm the back. question will... Oh, he's back. All right. So let Enrico do his oh, stuff the and then I'll shoot you guys a question. The prize is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Came back just in time. Yeah. No, you can go ahead or I can go whatever you prefer. No, go ahead. Show him, show him your drum and, and my, maybe your my mix bus. My kind of for some reason, crashing with Zoom um, once in a while. Well, gotcha. Uh, okay, so let me share my screen. Yep. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Okay, this is my uh, mix. Uh, everything in blue, dark blue is drums. Everything, the, the light uh, blue is bass. From here through here is harmonic instruments. And here are vocals. Okay, uh, here are my subgroups, drums, bass, harmonic instruments, and vocals, and my master right here. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, when I'm ready, I start mixing all in the box, and only once once the mix is done, I route these uh, subgroups to the SSL to further process them with the analog stuff. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, somebody asked me if uh, not asked me. Somebody asked a question as for a really common question, albeit a great one about processing things in the master phase. Uh, when I was more of a purist, I used to not at all. And then later on, I started, you know, turning on a compressor at the end of the mix, just to see how it would sound. And nowadays, the way I go is um, just after a, sh a short while after I started, I add a limiter at around 6 dB. And the reason I do that is to get used to how it's going to sound with 
a little more, uh, a little less headroom, a little more um, uh, overall gain. And, um, and also I think adding a limiter at 6 dB kind of simulates an analog uh, console and, and mix into analog tape because you would lose those peaks anyway when you, not lose, but you would compress those peaks, you know, working in the analog domain. So adding gotcha. uh, uh, a limiter at, this one is at 8.3 because, just because it is, uh, I had finished the mix this way, but I started at around five or six dB, you know. Of, so the um, threshold is at six dB. Yeah. Um, and then I may add a compressor maybe an SSL compressor, a bus compressor. On this mix here, I have a, a vintage warmer, which is the, or the first plugin I ever known from PSP AudioWare. And this mm -hmm. is, this doesn't model anything, but it's a real analog sounding plugin that I, I highly enjoy. Um, and once the mix is done, Can you hear me still? Yeah, we can still hear you. <laughs> yeah. Is your Pro Tools yeah, because, up? No, because uh, my yeah, Pro Tools is, is, is dragging. Once the well, mix is done, I compare my mix to other mixes that I possibly have mixed within the same album or to other mixes that I like. And then I add um, an, an EQ for tailoring the curve slightly. I mean, I don't go like fully tweaking because if, right. if I need to fully tweak an EQ in the master, it means that something has to be re redone in, in right. the, uh, within the mix. But, you know, just tweaking a curve within the master bus sounds different. You know, somebody may ask, why didn't you just add, you know, brightness to the vocal and to the drums and to, it doesn't sound the same. It's, it's the same it's the approach same. That, that, that you said about process. Oh, we lost them. Uh, okay, we lost them. So, um, guys, I'm gonna uh, ask the question now. So, Enrico, if you can maybe stop the share, and then um, actually, cool. Frank, we should tell everybody what they're gonna win first. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, uh, so what we're giving away is a ticket to an online live stream event in May with all of the speakers that we're going to have at the Miami Music Expo. So, there's going to be more details for that coming soon. Uh, but I have a question for you um, that you're going to answer. Uh, do you uh, do you want to put up the screen, Loic, or do you want me to ask the question first? How do you want to? Do it? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Now I routed the mic through the through the MacBook. So gotcha. Let's train here. So um, I'm gonna give them a question, Enrico. Um, do you have any last words that you want to do before I give them this question? And uh... no. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So my question to you guys is, uh, if you guys are paying attention on that Acoustica SSL plugin that I was using called 10, there is a, there is a knob that you can turn that I said, I really like, what is it called? Boom, Miguel in there early first man. Oh, you guys all remembered. I feel <laughs> so proud. You guys, oh, look at you. Oh, Miguel, you got it. I feel so loved. Um, just one last thing, guys, about all this stuff. Remember, it's like, it's not one thing. It's a bunch of little things that tend to add up, okay? It's not one plugin that's going to save your mix. It's little by little and experiment with stuff and try stuff. But remember that adding harmonics to your mix at different frequencies is going to give you different results. But this is what happens when you're mixing through a console. And it doesn't all happen at once. It happens little by little. So I'm done talking. I like, have one thing to add if I still okay. have time. Uh, I mentioned about the uh, limiter in the master uh, and, and overall uh, insert, uh, plug-in inserting in the master. I leave them in the master before, you know, when sending the, the track to mastering or when I send the track for myself to master. Besides the limiter, the limiter is one I take out. I take out. So if, if I'm sending this to somebody else to master, which is rare these days, because I, I do uh, uh, mastering, um, I will send 
that's how, that's how I ask people to send the masters to me. One with their limiters they are li used to be listening to and one mm -hmm. without the limiter. That's it. You know, gotcha. Because I have more room to work without the limiter. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Enrico. Loic? Yeah.